Everything we know in science was learned through experimentation and research. These form the foundation of science. Despite this, most students don't do any research until graduate school, if they go to graduate school. I've been helping my students perform real research from the beginning, even as they are first learning the basic principles of biology. This can be challenging at a community college, faced with limited funding and without expensive scientific equipment. Today, I will describe how my beginning biology students have been making real discoveries using advanced technologies and sharing their findings with the scientific community, all without spending any money. One of these students received support from NASA for this work, so I'll begin by describing how our research relates to space exploration. The Cassini spacecraft was launched in 1997 and spent 13 years in orbit around Saturn. It made many important discoveries during this time, but perhaps the most astonishing of these concerned a small moon named Enceladus. Scientists observed what appeared to be plumes of water erupting from the southern pole suggesting there might be oceans beneath the surface. So they sent the spacecraft back through to do chemical analysis, and they detected water, as well as methane and hydrogen. Both of these are indicators of hydrothermal activity in the oceans below the surface, where superheated water is forcibly ejected through cracks in the ice, creating the plumes. Now, this got a lot of interest as Deep-sea hydrothermal vents on Earth support an array of life in some of the most unique ecosystems on the planet. The life that lives at these vents survives in an extremely hostile environment. The surrounding water is nearly frozen, and they're at the bottom of the ocean, far from any sunlight. As this cold water, though, seeps into the sediment and comes into contact with the molten rock below, it re-erupts as a geyser of superheated water. Sometimes, these geysers bring with them energy-rich chemicals from the Earth, which precipitate out as they hit the cold water in what looks like black smoke. Now, this is key. There are bacteria, there are microorganisms here that are able to extract energy from these chemicals in a process known as chemosynthesis. This is key to how life can exist at the bottom of the ocean, far from any sunlight and without the photosynthesis of plants. And these chemosynthetic microorganisms form the base of the food chain which includes everything from shrimp and mussels to tube worms greater than six feet in length. And it's seeming more and more likely that if life exists elsewhere in our solar system, such as on Enceladus, it may resemble life at these vents and be reliant on chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. My students and I have been studying one of these deep-sea chemosynthetic microorganisms. Now, its name is difficult. Desulfurobacterium thermolithotrophum, which from here on out, I will just call Dester. It was, it's a type of bacteria, and it was taken directly from one of these vents, and so it can withstand very high temperatures and it feeds on hydrogen spewing from the vent. So it is, performs chemosynthesis critical for this ecosystem. Now, at this point, you may be wondering how at a community college we can study a bacteria from the bottom of the ocean that lives in near boiling water and feeds on hydrogen. Well, we didn't send a student down to the bottom of the ocean to look at it. Actually, not long after it was discovered, its genome was sequenced, and its genetic information was posted on an online data bank for anyone to study. So we've just been studying the details of its genetic instructions using the tools of bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field where biology meets computer science. 
It's used when the data from biology gets so large that computers are required to make sense of it. It has many applications in modern biology, including cancer therapy. For example, many cancer patients are unresponsive to drugs, not because the drugs are bad, but merely because they were an inappropriate treatment choice for that particular tumor. By analyzing the specific genetic abnormalities of that tumor, doctors are able to select a more appropriate chemotherapy, and in this way, reduce the number of cancers that don't respond to treatment. This type of medicine will be commonplace one day, and it will require both doctors and biologists knowledgeable in this field of bioinformatics. Now, another perhaps better well-known example of big data in biology is genomics. A genome is the complete set of instructions for an organism. These, this information is stored as DNA as a series of molecules referred to as A, C, G, and T. So when a genome is sequenced, it means all the A, C, Gs, and Ts of that organism have been determined. The human genome was sequenced in 2003, and since then, many, many more species have had their genomes sequenced. Shown here are just the bacterial genomes that had been sequenced by 2009. All of these were placed into one of these online data banks, and many more have been added since then, including our Dester. A small portion of one of these genomes looks something like this. So even to a biologist, this is meaningless. It's as if you're looking at a book written in a language you don't understand, or a string of ones and zeros. However, after sequencing, these genomes are put through a process of automated analysis, where the New DNA sequence is compared to ones that have already been studied, and in this way, small regions of the genome are determined to be genes based on similarity to genes that have already been characterized. This process is called genome annotation, and it's almost a type of footnotes to this sequence that's generated by computers. Here's an overview of the genome of Dester. The entire genome shown as a circle, and all these different colored bands are the different genes. There's about 1,500 of them in Dester. If we zoom into one portion, you can see the precise locations of these genes have been identified, and they've also been assigned names and functions. The problem is, these automated gene calls are wrong or incomplete about 10% of the time. For example, you can see here one gene that was merely labeled as hypothetical. There are some things that computers are very good at, but there's some things that people can still do better. And a pair of human eyes looking at this can sometimes catch and correct the mistakes that the computers were unable to. So this brings... this is where our community college students can be helpful, and brings me to the details of our research project. Students in my beginning biology class are each assigned a gene from Dester. They study it using a range of bioinformatics tools, and as they learn about their gene, most come to the conclusion that the original gene call was correct. However, occasionally a student finds a gene that has mistakes or is incomplete. These genes of interest are funneled to students willing to do more of this very challenging work. And these dedicated students start to make corrections. And as they make corrections, their notes are posted back to this database for review. And in this way, the initial mistaken gene call can be corrected in an almost Wikipedia style of editing. For example, one student who worked on this project researched several genes, including the one we saw labeled as hypothetical, and she supplied evidence that it was actually a true gene and assigned it, as well as several others, more appropriate names. These findings were presented at a national meeting for undergraduate 
community college research. And another student is currently working on the genes involved in chemosynthesis and will present these findings at an undergraduate meeting hosted by NASA. I'm very appreciative of these organizations that support undergraduate research. Even though it's beginning research and is often overlooked, it's very meaningful to these students that work on it. And I'm most of all grateful to these students who put so much effort into this project. It is very challenging work, and without them, none of it would be possible. And I do believe undergraduate research is important, as it makes learning biology more meaningful for students. It shows that science exists beyond the textbook and is more than just memorizing a bunch of facts and figures. By doing this type of on-the-job training, students are gaining real-life work skills using cutting-edge technologies while contributing to the collective scientific knowledge all from the beginning of their education. Thank you.